Now let's apply the same type of analysis to the cleavage of a pi bond. And here, the geometrical change involved is fundamentally different. What we're going to do is imagine taking a molecule like ethylene and twisting the plane of one of the trigonal planar carbons with respect to the other to bring the p orbitals that are overlapping to form the pi and pi star bonding and antibonding orbitals in the planar molecule into a perpendicular arrangement. And the idea is that that rotation essentially creates a diradicaloid structure from ground state ethylene with the two electrons in these p orbitals at right angles they're interacting much, much less, in fact, because they're at right angles to one another. And so we have, again, a classic diradicaloid structure. And in particular, as this rotation happens, we are generating diradicaloid character by decreasing the extent of pi bonding between the electrons. We can see that, for example, if we look at the dependence of the orbital energies on the dihedral angle between the two CH bonds at either carbon and ethylene. So this dihedral angle here refers to the angle between, say, this CH bond pointed directly out towards us and this CH bond pointed away from us associated with the other carbon. That starts out at zero degrees and we're in a classic pi bonding situation at zero degrees with pi and pi star orbitals that are separated quite a bit in energy because of the strong interaction between the p orbitals. But as this rotation starts to happen, that interaction starts to get weaker and we very quickly enter a diradicaloid region near the middle of the graph. And when we hit the 90 degree point where we are at this structure right here, now the two p orbitals are completely degenerate because there is no net overlap between these p orbitals at right angles. We've got simply two 2p orbitals. In fact, this it could be argued that this is just a pure diradical exactly at this geometry, although at all the geometries between 0 and 90 degrees, we're really dealing with diradical oids. So everything in here is a diradical oid, and the only point where we're dealing with a pure diradical is at exactly 90 degrees with those 2p orbitals now degenerate. Perpendicular, pointing in different directions in space, but degenerate. As we continue the rotation, we get the bonding interaction back, of course, and so the energies start splitting again with the pi orbital lower in energy and the pi star orbital higher in energy, and it's not surprising that this graph is symmetric because that rotation creates a structure that is either identical to or enantiomeric with the corresponding structure on the other side of the graph. For example, the 120 degree structure is identical to the 60 degree structure in the case of ethylene. Just like we did for the sigma bonding process, let's now think through the possible electron configurations. And so for planar ethylene, we have the classic set of S0, T1, S1, and S2 with varying types of excitation of the pi electrons. So S0 is a pi 2 state. T1 is a triplet pi pi star state. S1, singlet pi pi star state. And S2 is the state in which we've taken both pi electrons and excited them into the pi star pi antibonding orbital. In the twisted 90 degree structure, we now have four distinct possibilities. We have the singlet diradical. Let's actually look at that on this structure over here. We have the singlet diradical where the electrons have anti-parallel spins. We have the triplet diradical where the electrons have parallel spins. We have a Z1 state in which both electrons are now paired in one of the p orbitals, anti-parallel spins, of course, as required by the Pauli principle. And we have the Z2 state with both electrons paired in the other p orbital, like so. And for ethylene, of course, Z1 and Z2 are degenerate, as are the singlet and triplet diradicals. The Z states will not be degenerate for a polar pi bond. We'll look at that in a second. The next natural question we ask is, how do these states of planar ethylene correlate with these states of the 90 degree twisted ethylene in a continuous way? What are the potential energy surfaces that connect these various possible states? That's where the state correlation diagram comes in, and for the twisting of a pi bond, the state correlation diagram looks like this. Now, just like the orbital 
diagram that we saw at the start of this video, this is symmetric with respect to the 90 degree point. So we only really need to concern ourselves with the left or the right half of the graph, starting from a dihedral of zero degrees and rotating to 90. Something we can notice straight away is that the triplet state correlates with a triplet diuretical. We've seen that this is a general idea that T1 states can only correlate with triplet diuraticals, and there is a decrease in the energy of the T1 state because of relaxed electron-electron repulsion as the rotation happens. The S0 state has strong pi bonding character. Because rotation breaks the pi bond, it's unsurprising that we're going uphill in energy, and this state correlates with a singlet diuretical with one electron in each of the p orbitals because the pi bonding orbital where those electrons lived had large density between the two carbons. So intuitively, it makes sense that the pi two state should correlate with the singlet diuretical. Both of the S1 and S2 states correlate with these Witter ionic states. S2, for a very similar reason to the sigma bond cleavage case, we've got two electrons in the pi antibonding orbital. Those will tend to remain paired as this rotation takes place, and the resulting state will include both electrons on one or the other of the p orbitals. Of course, for ethylene, we have a degeneracy situation. For a polar pi bond, the situation is more complicated. We'll see that on the next slide. And the same is true for S1. The pi pi star excited state must correlate with a Zwitter ionic structure, Z1 or Z2, if they're degenerate. Because these are antibonding in the planar ethylene structure, rotation to break the bond actually stabilizes these states by removing the anti-bonding character associated with them due to the geometric change, due to the movement of the p orbitals out of alignment. When we talk about polar pi bonds, for example, in an emmy, a carbon-nitrogen double bond, the key difference, again, is that the energies of the z states will differ, with the more stable z state being associated with putting the electrons in the orbital at the more electronegative atom. And just as in the sigma bond case, we run into this problem that S2 correlates with the higher energy Z2 states. It's not really a problem, it's just sort of a fact of life, right? That S2 is our pi star 2 state. So let's talk through again why S2 correlates with the higher energy Z2 state. S2 is the pi star 2 state, and in a pi containing chromophore like an imine with a polarized pi bond like this, that pi star orbital is predominantly located or has the higher density or the, the larger lobes on the less electronegative atom, on the carbon atom. And so in the pi star two state, we have most of the electron density on carbon. As this state evolves, that electron density will tend to remain on carbon until we get to the Z2 state, which is well described by a situation where we have now both electrons on carbon, negative charge, and positive charge on the nitrogen atom. In the S1 state, which is pi pi star in character, we still have a good bit of electron density on the Me nitrogen, and so this state, as the rotation happens, correlates with the Z state where we have the usual, quote unquote, the more familiar positive charge on carbon and negative charge on the more electronegative nitrogen atom. So in many ways, this picture actually mirrors what we saw for polarized sigma bonds. The S2 state results in polarization that is very much opposite our chemical intuition based on ground state ideas, while the S1 state tends to lead to the typical ground state polarization that we're, we're used to, just in more extreme form. 